From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul, Mission Control Decadent. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. This is a... This is a pretty exciting episode for us, folks. This is a food episode, and if you are a longtime listener, a fellow conspiracy realist, you're probably already pretty familiar with how easily the three of us get derailed by little details in a show. I mean, at this point, we have probably, all of us, you listening along at home too, we've probably collectively lost hours exploring weird little cuisine-related details about one sort of meal or another. We talked about the sugar conspiracy with our pal Lauren Vogelbaum. That's very much true. We talked about the uh, disturbing origins of chocolate. Also true. And I was thinking, I don't know if you guys remember this. Don't forget cheese. The cheese conspiracy. Big cheese. Who could forget big cheese? God, that one's real, too. I still think about that one. Good call, Matt. Uh, there, there's also, like, there was a uh, a beautiful moment. I don't know whether you guys remember, but uh, a while back, we did an episode on a weird government-associated private institution known as the family, right? They're, they're a huge power in um, right-wing religious politics in the U.S., and they're they're the folks who started the prayer breakfast, and at one point in that episode, we dropped everything and tried to figure out what was on the menu at the prayer breakfast. It became very, very important to us, and we're like, well, is it just pancakes? Are they doing like an eggs benedict thing? We got to figure this out. A breakfast bar, perhaps, you know, a mm-hmm. kind of maybe a, an omelet station. That'd be pretty exciting. As long as it's not continental. You know what I mean? Continental breakfast. It's like just, it's, I, I always, I think it's to the hotel, a, I'm like, what, just, what a misnomer. Tell me, <laughs> just tell me you don't like me. Exactly. Like, let's, let's stop this charade, you know? It's a, uh, it's it, a marketing <laughs> play for sure. I mean, like when I think of continental breakfast, I think of like, you know, sampling cu- breakfast cuisines of the world, not like a dry muffin and like a yogurt cup. Mm, and a vintage melon. That's in its later years. <laughs> Anyhow, this is this is all to say that we love talking about food anytime, all the time. We are so down to clown for that. But today's episode is introducing us to some things that most people in the U.S. and abroad probably rather not think about. And I, maybe we start this way. So, Matt, Noel, do you guys have guilty pleasure foods yeah, I actually just ordered one that should be arriving right when I get out of this. It's called a pizza puff. You ever heard of this? Pizza puff. They, they're big in Chicago. There's a place called Chicago Skip's Chicago Dog that's in like an Avondale neighborhood around here. And they do like, you know, Philly cheese type things, Chicago style. But they have this thing called a pizza puff that is like only really available in Chicago and that area. Or there's more popular. And it's like a hot pocket, but like airier and like more like <laughs> puffy kind of is that, it's, like, it's like saying pizza puff too so i would say that's a guilty pleasure food for me it's a hot pocket with a tie on got it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. what about you matt uh for me it's a fried chicken sandwich of any sort that's like my mm. guilty pleasure food and uh if you I, like hot yeah. chicken you ever do a hot chicken sandwich? Yeah, like that's a, probably the, my favorite. You know, Nashville style. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, but it, the the problem just is the amount of calories that's in it compared to how full I feel after I eat it. It just doesn't balance out. Yeah, I know what you mean. And uh, I am as as everyone knows, I'm I'm pretty non discriminatory when it comes to food. I'm sort of a walking garbage can. So I, <laughs> but there's a clear way. I just eat things. <laughs> like, right there's, there's, there's a clear one winner. clear winner oh the 
the humble quesadilla, right? How dare right. you? That is not junk food. <laughs> that is not junk food. That is the uh, next step in the long evolution of the sandwich. No, you're right. You got me. No, it's true. It's true. We got them. Hashtag. Uh, yeah, I love quesadillas. I cannot remember any time in my life, any single instant where I was around a quesadilla and said no to it. I may have a problem. You never met a quesadilla you didn't like. You ever had like a fancy quesadilla, like with lobster or bechamel oh, yeah. or some sort of lardons, mm-hmm. perhaps? Oh, mm-hmm. I have. I've I've even dabbled in the world of sweet quesadillas, which was a regrettable phase in my career. But Yikes. you know, these are questions. Can you tell you have a situation. <laughs> it's, yeah. Uh, let's see. I did not tell it. Uh, we could get into it, but this doesn't have to be the quesadilla episode, though. Now that you mentioned it, I, I probably will have one for lunch today. But let's start at the beginning. Here are the facts. Junk food is kind of an American term, right? You associate it with the um, hyper-realistic image of American culture, right, of post-World War II America. That's what most people think of, right? They think of the 50s, they think of the 60s, the rise of fast food joints and the um, the mass marketing of processed foods and snacks. But even though that term is not used as often today, it's almost always going to be a pejorative. Nobody is using the phrase junk food in a study or a headline and extolling its praises, uh, even though it's a pejorative, everybody knows what it describes. We're talking candy, chips, fried stuff, soda, the salt, the fatty, the cloyingly sweet stuff. Uh, a lot of fast food also gets described as junk food, but that's more of a Venn diagram situation. They're not really the same thing. You can go to um, now, at least in the U.S., you can go to a lot of fast food places And if you read carefully, you can eat some healthy stuff. Um, Most people don't. I think that's fairly obvious, uh, ourselves included. Well, I mean, Burger King's gotten into the impossible burger game at the very least. But even an impossible burger, while not being beef, still isn't exactly good for you, right? Like, it's a lot of calories as well, a lot of carbs, um, you know, but at least it's more sustainable, and there's definitely positive things in in a big company like uh, Burger King getting on board with, um, you know, meatless options. Yeah, I consider KFC's new plant-based chicken products that still have a ton of sugar in them. Actually, I (laughs) I I haven't looked at the sugar content, but I can only imagine. Oh, KFC, home of the double down. You brilliant monsters. You spend so much time figuring out whether you could do something that you didn't stop to ask whether you should. Uh, <sighs> I never had Chicken for down. bread, right? Chicken <laughs> yes. sandwiched between chicken. It's yeah. just three pieces of chicken with crap and in the middle. Ch- cheese and bacon. Yes. Yes. Very important. That stuff is clutch, as they were saying in the early 2000s. Uh, We'll we'll get to we'll explore some of the um, controversy around fast food and its place in the world of junk food in a bit. But the first problem with just the phrase, the concept junk food, is that it is an incredibly broad definition. It is an umbrella term that describes a huge range of literally countless products at this point. And they all have one commonality, whether we are talking about ice cream or potato chips or what have you. Junk food is, as you pointed out, Noel, it's high in calories, but those calories are from often from refined sugar and or different types of fat, and there are relatively low amounts of nutritional value. Uh, the, the fancier name for junk food, if you want to sound a little more academic and a little less, you know, clickbaity, I guess, is to call it HF. SS food. Those are things that, let's see if everyone can hear the acronym here. Those are things that are high in fat, salt, and sugar. But we all we all call it junk food and we all know what we're talking about. It's the really crazily processed stuff. You know what I mean? Imagine if you are a time traveler from the 16 or the 1700s, right? And you go into a store First off, you're probably amazed by the concept of a supermarket, but you go in there and you're like, wait, this stuff doesn't have to 
doesn't go bad. Yeah. Like how how can how long can this can of meat sit on this shelf? Well, have you ever dropped a McDonald's French fry in your car and then found it when you're cleaning like a month later and it's still French fry like? Like it's not molded or anything. It's just kind of like petrified. But there's some magical something in those that make them like not mold. And it's probably some of the stuff that also makes them like not great for you. Yeah, you're right. Uh, but what Ben Ben, what you're getting at here is exactly what I was thinking about. The concept that there are all these foods that last quite a bit longer than food really should. And much of the junk food is the reasons that it's high in fat, salt, and sugar is because you can use these things uh, along with some other new food additives that you know we've discovered as a species. Uh, they can keep this stuff on the shelf for a long, long, long time. And it's so it's easy to manufacture. There's not a ton of overhead in the actual ingredients that are going into the thing. And so it becomes cheap to manufacture and it sticks around for a long time. Yeah. And uh, this this has some clear and distinct advantages to the average consumer um, who, you know, isn't always going to be able to afford top dollar for like ethically sourced, locally made, organic, et cetera, et cetera. You know what I mean? You, you come down very quickly to the reality of uh, the situation being one, I have to feed myself consistently and predictably. And two, for a lot of people, I've got some kids. I got to feed these kids and they hate everything that's healthy. You know what I mean? So like, I've got to continue this Cold War negotiation with a very hard-nosed eight-year-old about Fruit Loops. You know, <laughs> like it's it's tough. Do you guys remember what the tagline for Checkers used to be, or maybe still yes. is? Yes, you gotta eat. He gotta eat. <laughs> They're right. <laughs> You know, I really like what Arby's is doing. For some reason, there's something so absurd and surreal about Arby's latest uh, or their current ad regime. Uh, they're just saying, we have the meats. Like that is, and the tagline works and it shouldn't. And I wonder how they came up with it. I wonder like how the, how many other jingles or catchphrases they went through until they said, in Forget it. Just tell people we have roast beef. And someone's like, wait, wait, wait. We have chicken too. And then they're like And turkey. Do they still make They've those? Got a turkey sandwich. This, yeah, they still make those massive sandwiches, those club sandwiches. That was like a big promotion back in the day. <laughs> We're Arby's and we make market fresh sandwiches. <laughs> right. Market fresh. Two words that sound like something when they're put together. Uh, but you know, Pretty sound and fury. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sound and fury signify nothing. Same as it ever was. But this um there's something that's really interesting. I think we've talked about this off air before. Like if you are not from the U.S. and you visit the U.S., if you've ever visited here at some point or you came to live here, one of the first things that will consistently surprise you is going to be the food. It is crazy here. There is so much great food. So much of it is so bad for you. Um, I think like all, all of my friends who are nationals from other countries, uh, whether they are like very high polluting professors, whether they're someone traveling on a gap year, whether they're like whomever they are, they always point this out. The portions are huge. There are things in the industry of U.S. food that don't really exist in other places, like free refills on soda. That's not a thing in a lot of other places, right? Like, uh, we, we, we've got everything. We got supersized stuff. You can, you can go into any convenience store on this planet and for like less than $3, you can get a barrel of soda or slushy. And the we big mean a barrel. Gulp. The big yes, gulp. Yes. Yeah. Again, think, think, gulp. Of, think about why it works, guys. Because it's right, we talked about this before. The fries, generally, that's what include is included in supersizing something. The fries and the drink, the two cheapest things to produce on their menus. You just get more of the stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Absolutely. And and there's this. Um, to me, it's fascinating. There's this new era of 
combining brands and flavors like Taco Bell will have a Doritos taco or whatever. And um, whenever we mention Doritos, shout out to our pal Robert Evans. Uh, we see these. The Dolja Cat extra value meal. <laughs> you know right, I mean? right. Branded McDonald's meals. Um, someone at Nabisco is a lunatic and they're like, what can't an Oreo be flavored with? You know what I mean? Like we're <laughs> people are finding these iterations or companies rather are finding these iterations of slightly changed new stuff, novelty stuff, and trying to figure out if that becomes the hottest new thing. This doesn't always work for a long time. There was a museum that was a, uh, kind of a hall of shame of failed, <laughs> failed food products. And that's where we run into stuff like, um, do you remember when, I think it was Heinz, uh, a while back, they had said, ketchup doesn't have to be red. Let's make it green. Let's make it purple. Let's see if kids are into it. Mm -mm. They weren't. No, that's gross. <laughs> Kids know what ketchup is. The color's part of it. Making it green, that just, that, that, honestly, I'm picturing tasting green ketchup, and in my mind, it would be like disfluency. It wouldn't taste the same, just like based on my visual input. Absolutely, yeah. Everybody has uh, that low-level synesthesia, I would think, because like we don't talk about it maybe as often as we should as a society but the concept of taste and everything that goes into it it's um it's almost like the way people analyze hallucinogens there's scene and setting and you are your interpretation of the taste of what you're eating is highly based on your visual input like yeah green ketchup Tastes different because your eyes are helping you taste it. And your eyes are like, eh, this is green. I don't trust it. Well, it's like someone once told me, I didn't believe it. Maybe it was you, Ben, that all Fruit Loops taste the same, but they're yeah. different colors. And in my mind, that makes one of them taste like lime. And this one tastes like razzleberries, you know, but apparently mm. they all taste the same. It's just your brain tricking you into thinking they taste different because they're different colors. Or like Powerade and Gatorade literally tastes blue there's a flavor we just all call it blue yep there's not like a blue fruit that we know of that's involved there's a it's berry just blue there's a berry that is blue <laughs> is that where they get the name of the color from just from from the berry that's the, that's the uh the most naturally occurring natural blue <laughs> right so uh yeah, and shout out to Dave Chappelle, grape drink, and so on. So the science here, clearly, clearly the science here is objectively amazing. Like we're talking about with the um, the breakthroughs in processing food and making it last longer. In theory, this could be a very, very good thing for hundreds of millions of people around the world who are experiencing food insecurity, Right now, you can have something that doesn't go bad within a few days or a few weeks. I mean, a, a double cheeseburger at McDonald's is literally ninety nine cents. You know, for <clears throat> someone that's starving, it it does tick the boxes of like you know caloric sustenance. Um, so one could argue that they are providing a service in some ways. You know, and there's so many of them; they're so available. I don't know. Now, just you, now you can not Why only you have food; <laughs> you can also have type two diabetes. You're welcome. Well, I'm just saying it's I, I, I don't mean to oversimplify. I just mean, you know, there are people that that is a an option. It's a big deal. You know? I agree. I am. I'm not I'm not disagreeing. I'm just saying there's a cost. There's an added extra 100%. cost that is unseen. Yes. Yes. To the healthcare system. <laughs> like the right. Of all of that. A long, mm. a long tail cost. It, it ultimately, at some point, that double cheeseburger may be costing consumers much more than ninety-nine cents a pop. If you look at, if you look at chronic health conditions that can result from this, and I'm, this is not a hit piece on fast food. Obviously, we love this stuff. We love junk food, uh, but there are things we need to know about this. Probably one of the best examples, or like most zeitgeisty examples of just how far fa processed food has come are things like spam and things like the humble 
Twinkie. Uh, Josh and Chuck are <laughs> compadres over at Stuff You Should Know. Years and years ago, did an excellent deep dive into the story of the Twinkie. I'm pretty sure that was them. And this thing just, it's like, again, it, it feels like we're a time traveler from the 1600s. Twinkies stay edible much longer than they should. You know, up until quite recently in the history of humanity, that was considered very strange, and, and rightly so. At this point, I think we should pause for a word from our sponsor. <laughs> Maybe Arby's, I don't know. Uh, and let's return to dive into just how much junk we're talking about. We're back. Uh, peek behind the curtain. I, I'm trying to say this diplomatically, but most of the times now, I was thinking about when people use the word junk, and most of the times now, I only hear the word junk used in the phrase junk food, or honestly, when people are re referring to their genitalia, right? Oh, yeah. That's a good old trusty. I like that. You know, uh, there's also <laughs> junk bonds. Remember that? That was like a financial oh, yeah. thing. I think that refers to like crappy stocks. I don't really know. I always think about a junkyard, like a place where cars go to die and then the parts of them live again. Oh, that's poetic. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> junk bonds have a high, are bonds issued by companies that have a high risk of default. Right. Right. It's a, a high risk potentially high profit. But when we're when we're talking about junk food, we're talking about a lot of junk and we're talking about really fascinating modern history. Uh, snacks have existed forever. Snacks predate the written word. Snacks predate human beings. We know that uh, other primates and the vast assortment of animals have like their their favorite preferred snacks and so on. Uh, and there are things that are considered like the primo goods to, you know, corvids to uh, th this applies to like cetaceans as well. Every living thing kind of loves snacks. Uh, but the idea of unhealthy, cheap, mass-produced food uh, re really kind of has its origin point in the popularization of refined sugar. And the harbinger of modern junk food, according to most food historians, the, like the first really known, well-known example is Cracker Jacks. And I, I, I need some help on this one, guys. Is it Cracker Jack? Or Cracker Jacks? Is it singular or plural? I thought it was apostrophe S. Yes. Well, I whoa, might be wrong. Whoa, whoa Matt, you're chaotic <laughs> evil today. 